Hello everyone, welcome to the Cell and Gene Therapy Digital Week, brought to you by the producers of the face-to-face -face Cell and Gene Therapy Manufacturing and Commercialization events, visiting Boston in September and Amsterdam in December. My name is Catherine Simpson and I'll be your host for today's session titled, A Novel Biolo Interfermary BLA a BLI solution for accurate AAV capsids quantification and empty full ratio determination. First, I'll cover some quick housekeeping items. If you experience difficulties with audio or advancing slides, refresh your screen with F5. If you are experiencing other issues, hit the question mark button to receive assistance. At any time during the presentation, submit your questions in the Q&A window on the left-hand side of your screen. In 24 hours, you'll receive a link to watch the recording of this session. Let's now begin by introducing our speaker from GatorBio, Robert Zook, CTO of GatorBio. Thank you for joining us today, everyone, and now I'll hand it over to Robert to begin the presentation. Okay. Okay, good morning, everyone. First of all, I'd like to start by saying that uh, I'm very excited to have the opportunity to present Gator Bio's AAV biosensors. We believe these biosensors can make a contribution um, in the development of gene therapy products. Okay. We're going to cover several topics today. First of all, uh, it'll be the challenges of uh, AAV uh, quantitation. I'll briefly touch upon the uh, Gator Bio history. We'll also discuss um, AAV quantitation issues in upstream and downstream processes. And lastly, I'm going to introduce the Gator Bio method for empty versus full um, uh, ratios. And at the end, I'm going to show uh, data that um, uh, the method can be applied uh, for uh, crude cell lysates and we can still use the method uh, to derive very accurate to empty versus full uh, ratios. And in the end, we'll um, have a, a question and answer session. Okay, um, the history of Gator Bio is that um, our analytical methods, our biosensors have been widely used in the biotherapeutic industry. Okay. The methods uh, have been uh, a very useful tool in the development and optimization of therapeutic antibodies. Our core technology, BLI, biolayer interferometry, has been recognized uh, by the U.S. Pharmacopoeia as a um, analytical method. And our plan is to continue the success with BLI uh, by going into the AAB field uh, by combining BLI with other technologies. Recently, we have launched a AAVX and AAV9 uh, biosensor for um, uh, AAV quantitation. Okay, Gator, it's an analytical system. It has three components, probes, instruments, and software. Okay, the probe actually is a very small uh, a glass probe uh, that's uh, only one millimeter in diameter. It's about a centimeter long, and it has a optical sensing layer uh, at the distal tip. We have several instruments. Uh, these instruments um, handle samples in a micro titer plate format. It can handle 96 and 384 well plates. The current instruments have eight channels, so we can process uh, up to eight samples uh, in a parallel manner. And in a few months, uh, we're going to launch a high throughput instrument for um, screening applications. And we do have dedicated software for the Gator system, uh, and the software is 21 CFR Part 11 compliant. Okay, the wide range of application with uh, uh, Gator uh, biosensors is shown on this slide, okay? As you can see that in the antibody domain, we have a, um, a, a very uh, large menu of biosensors, and this reflects uh, the fact that we do have a, um, a significant presence in the biotherapeutics industry. You can see under AAV, we have two products, but our long-term goal is to provide a full menu of biosensors uh, to support the gene therapy industry, very similar to what we have done uh, previously uh, in biotherapeutics. Okay, let me go on to the uh, BLI, our core technology. 
Basically, it's a glass probe and we have an optical layer that has a different refractive index um, compared to the, uh, the glass probe. So there, are, if there is incident light shine from the top, there are um, two, um, two reflection layers. First at the uh, glass probe uh, optical layer interface. And then the second reflection is at the um, uh, optical layer um, uh, fluid interface. How do we start? We have a video here to start to illustrate this. Let's see. Okay. All right. So you can see the incident light uh, coming and you'll see the uh, two reflection layers and they form an interference pattern. And uh, we monitor the change in the interference pattern and that interference pattern is a function of the thickness of the optical layer. So if a biomolecule binds to this surface, that will increase the, the thickness of the optical layer and it will cause a shift in the um, interference pattern. Okay. And you can see here that uh, if a second biomolecule forms a complex with the first layer, there will be an additional shift in the uh, interference pattern. Okay. Also, one can monitor the disassociation of a complex um, that's uh, formed on the surface, um, and one can monitor the reduction in the interference pattern with a downward rate. Okay. So this is the basis of our label-free detection. Okay. One can monitor the association rate okay, of uh, the formation of uh, binding complexes on the surface to derive quantitation, and then one can also use the upward uh, slope due to the association and the downward slope in the interference pattern due to the disassociation as a analytical method to optimize antibody binding affinities. Okay, one can derive on-rate constants, off-rate constants, and KDs uh, using this method. And this is one of the reasons why the method has a, um, a large application in uh, antibody development. Okay. The method is very simple. All one has to do is uh, dip the probe into a sample. The samples can be already pre-formatted in a microtiter plate, and the instrument will move the probe from sample to sample or even from sample to other reagents. Okay, This is very simple to perform. If I was to compare this approach to, say, ELISA methods, where uh, the uh, solid phase is held stationary and one adds reagents and samples, Movement of the probe is much easier. Okay, now let's move on to uh, AAV uh, applications. Okay, there are significant challenges that remain in uh, the uh, AAV quantitation domain. Okay, there are three major areas of application, capsid titer, genome titer, and uh, empty versus full ratio. There are many methods in each one of these areas that have, that have been applied but they all have various performance requirements. Okay. Assay time, sample volume, sample preparation, um, analytical requirements in terms of sensitivity and dynamic range. Okay. In spite of all the methods that have been applied, there still is a need for something fast and easy. Okay. Our um, Gator Bio, um, um, Biosensors target capsid titer and the uh, MP versus full ratio. Let's move on to the next slide. Okay, so I'll spend a few moments here describing our AAVX uh, biosensor. It can quantitate AAV serotypes from what, one through 10. It has a dynamic range of 10 to the 9th to 10 to the 14th VP per mil. It can monitor the binding in real time. So you can see on the graph, this is a dose response curve of uh, AAV8 at different concentrations, and one can derive the concentration by simply taking the initial binding slope. The method is robust. It can uh, perform uh, analysis and crude samples, and it has very high reproducibility. And lastly, under some protocols, these probes can be reused. Now, if we compare this to um, ELISA, which is the most common uh, method for quantitation, uh, the Gator system is very fast. Okay? It only, uh, uh, actually, we get the first results in two minutes, and we can provide 96 results from a full microtiter plate in a total of 26 minutes. 
So this is much faster than ELISA, which typically takes around four hours, okay? The assay is fully automated, and even though it's fast and automated, there's no sacrifice in sensitivity, and actually the precision is much greater than what ELISA can ever achieve. Now, there are, could be other applications of the uh, AAVX, AAVX probe beyond upstream and downstream quantitation. For example, the uh, probe can be configured to um, uh, possibly measure neutralizing antibody uh, in clinical samples. So let me move on to our uh, the next AAV method that's in actually in late stage development. And this is an ultra sensitive uh, AAV assay format. Okay, so we're comparing the two probes here, AAVX and the ultra sensitive uh, AAVX assay. Okay. On the left, you can see the um, AAVX, it's, it uses the um, capture select antibody and it can monitor the binding um, uh, of the capsid. On the right side, is the ultra sensitive format. Basically it's a sandwich assay using a capture, um, uh, a capture uh, nanobody, a capture select nanobody uh, that's immobilized on the probe. And it has a second reagent, which is a um, capture select antibody that's linked to the enzyme uh, HRP. So after the formation of the immune complex, the probe is transferred over to a substrate solution and the uh, enzyme activity is monitored. This uh, substrate is selected because it has a property when it's oxidized by the enzyme, it precipitates or binds to the surface of the optical layer. And this particular substrate has a very high refractive index. So at, it can generate a very large change in the interference pattern. Okay, in terms of assay time, AAV, AAVX uh, is fast. You can get results, initial results in two minutes. Ultra sensitive takes 30 minutes and does require uh, the amplification step. However, its advantage is in sensitivity. If you compare it to AAVX, uh, which has a, a detection limit of around 10 to the eighth VP per mil, the uh, ultra sensitive assay format is about a hundred fold more sensitive than the um, uh, it can detect uh, down to uh, 10 to the 6 VP per mil. Okay. Now, actually, we, we view both of these sensors as being uh, very complementary. Okay. All right. It's complementary in considering upstream and downstream processes for AABX or AAB uh, sample quantitation, where the material goes through the growth phase, purification, and QC. As you can see here, that the combination of the ultra-sensitive AAV assay and AAVX can uh, cover the full uh, application range. If you compare and contrast this to other commercially available AAVX assays, such as ELISA and a fluid, fluidic disk method uh, using fluorescence detection, um, those methods have a much narrower uh, analytical range and consequently their range of application is also uh, correspondingly uh, reduced. Okay, now another question regarding the uh, ultra sensitive assay is whether or not it can uh, uh, work with uh, crude samples. Okay, so in this particular study, we took HEC 293T cells and we cultured them uh, under culture conditions and uh, cell densities that would simulate AAV production. Okay. And then we took those cells through the first step of purification that included the cell lysis and the clarification step. Okay. And then we did a, um, a conventional spike recovery where we compared the cell lysate uh, spike, uh, spikes and spikes into buffer. And in this case, we made several uh, spikes um, in the uh, 10 to the minus or 10 to the seventh uh, range. And you can see here that the recovery ranges from about 80 to about 90%. So this is an early indication that this method does have the potential um, to perform uh, accurate AAV quantitation at low capsid concentrations. 
Okay, now I'm going to move on to the uh, AAV empty versus full method that we have. And it has a, a uh, what I call a multi-step specificity. Now, what I mean by that is that in this method, there are two binding steps and they're performed in sequence. And each binding step has a high level of binding specificity. And this endows the method with a high level of robustness and enables it to be applied to crude cell lysates. Okay, just as an overview of uh, empty versus full measurement methods, Measuring empty versus full uh, ratios it remains a challenge in the uh, development and manufacture of uh, gene therapy vectors. There are a variety of analytical modalities or methods okay, that have some correlation to empty versus full ratios. Okay. Some of these methods are based on size distribution, charge, PCR methods, UV adsorption, uh, and there are several others. Okay. The problem is that these methods require a purification step, which is time consuming, labor intensive, and just because a sample has been purified, it doesn't mean that it's, it's actually pure. There's a possibility, and there have been reports, that trace contaminants can also cause interference. Our approach is to detect the total DNA or the total SSDNA content uh, in AAV. We believe that this is the relevant target. Actually, the, these alternative methods, they're secondary because they're a consequence of the DNA content. So I'll give you an overview of the, meth of the empty versus full method that we have. It's a three-step workflow. First of all, there is an affinity capture step using a AABX probe. Okay, and this can be performed in crude samples. After the uh, capture of the uh, capsid, there's a lysis step that will remove and liberate the single strand DNA from the bound capsid. Then there's a third step uh, where a single strand DNA assay is performed. Okay, both of these steps, the affinity capture and the single strand DNA are highly specific. Okay, and I think this is what it gives the method uh, its robustness that we can actually measure in crude cell lysates. So at this point, I'm going to describe uh, each one of these steps in uh, a little bit of detail. Okay, so the affinity capture step, the overall approach is to capture the same amount of plasmid, or excuse me, the same amount of capsid from probe to probe or sample to sample. Okay, and to do that, there is a predetermined uh, defined amount of the capsid that is added uh, to the sample. Okay. And at that point, one monitors the binding in real time. Okay. As you can see here on the, on the graph, we have uh, capture kinetics of uh, AAV8 at different uh, capsid concentrations. Okay. This method has a lot of flexibility depending on the capsid concentration and how long one wants to spend um, capturing the capsid. Okay. In our research, we standardize it at this point in time uh, using a 2 times 10 to the 11th BB per mil and we capture for 25 minutes. Okay. But one of the advantages of this technique is that we can monitor the capture. We can use the label-free binding uh, to first of all, optimize and characterizing uh, the capture um, uh, format. And then we can use the real-time monitoring to assure that unknown samples have been uh, captured uh, very reproducibly. Okay. Lastly, this is essentially an infinity purification step. Okay. We use the uh, capture select nanobody, which has been commonly used uh, for affinity purification. So it gives us a high degree of uh, specificity but also in affinity purification, there's another issue to consider, and that's non-specific binding. Okay, we have found that um, the non-specific non binding of crude cell lysates is very little with this method. Okay, and this is because first of all, the the probe has a um, you know, very low surface or very small surface area. The optical layer is only one millimeter in diameter. 
And secondly, um, the probe has proprietary coatings that have been designed to minimize the um, non-specific binding. Okay. The other factor in terms of getting capture um, on the probe is uh, the reproducible, uh, the reproducibility of the uh, probe uh, 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 binding step. I can show you here that uh, this is a uh, precision study um, with uh, AAV8. You can see here that uh, we can achieve uh, CVs uh, as low as 3%. And this high level of precision isn't necessarily restricted to uh, AAVX probes. Uh, all of the Gator Viral probes have very good CVs. Okay. So after the, um, you know, the capture step, the probe is transferred over to a uh, lysis reagent and the lysis step is performed uh, by heating the sample at 70 C for five minutes. Okay. We found that this is very fast, it's very robust, it gives us complete lysis in a very reproducible manner. Okay. We have validated this with AAV8 and uh, AAV5 because uh, there have been reports that AAV5 was the most heat stable of all the serotypes. After the uh, lysis step, then we perform the third step, which is the DNA assay. So here. Okay, so the DNA assay is essentially using a second probe, and it's really essentially a, uh, a sandwich amino assay where one has a uh, antibody immobilized on the probe. This antibody is highly specific for single-stranded DNA. Okay, after the binding, of single-stranded DNA, there's a second reagent, okay, which is a um, antibody also to single-stranded DNA, and it's linked to the enzyme peroxidase. And after the complex formation, it's transferred over to a, a substrate solution, and it generates uh, enzymatic product, uh, and it generates a, um, a phase shift uh, in a manner very similar to what we described with the, uh, the ultra-sensitive assay. The data on the left is a dose response curve using uh, single-stranded plasmid M13 as a model analyte. We use this to uh, optimize and characterize uh, the DNA assay. It's fairly close to the uh, size of uh, uh, AAB genomes. The total assay time is uh, 20 minutes, uh, and the LOD is, uh, again, using M13 as the uh, DNA sample is uh, around uh, 100 uh, picograms per mil. And I might add that when we assay DNA derived from uh, AAB, uh, these signals range from about two nanometers and higher. So that indicates that the sensitivity of the uh, DNA assay is just not an issue at all in this particular method. And then I'm going to show um, one example of performing um, the empty versus full method, taking the sample through uh, all three steps. Okay. In this uh, study, okay, we made mixtures of empty versus full capsids. Okay. We started with uh, a sample that was 85% um, full, determined by AU, AUC, and then we made six mixtures. Okay, and these were all assayed at the same total AAB concentration of two times 10 to the 11th uh, VP per mil. We captured them for 25 minutes, and then we monitored the capture. The signal shift was only uh, was uh, 18 uh, nanometers, and the CV, as I mentioned earlier, was very good. It's only 3%, so this indicated that the uh, uh, capture between these different mixtures um, was very reproducible. Then we perform the lysis step, and then lastly, the DNA assay. And you can see here, here's our dose response curve, plotting the, uh, the DNA nanometer shift versus the percent full. You can see here that we have a very um, uh, good dose response curve with an adequate slope, with adequate separation between uh, the various samples. And this would enable accurate and precise uh, quantification of unknown samples. So the next study was to apply this method uh, with uh, crude cell lysates. Okay. And again, 
in this study, we um, we uh, cultured HEC 293 uh, T cells, very similar to what we did with the uh, ultra sensitive AAB method. They were cultured um, under conditions and cell densities that uh, replicated uh, or, or simulated AAV production, and it took it was they were uh, taken through the uh, one step, uh, the first step of purification. And you can see here that uh, we performed, or we uh, formulated uh, three samples um, of empty versus full, um, targeting low, mid, and high empty versus full ratios. And we supplemented a buffer sample and the live cell samples um, with these spiked uh, mixtures, again, at total capsid concentrations of two times 10 to the 11th. And you can see here that the recovery uh, is very good. It's around 100%. So this is an indication that uh, the method can tolerate uh, crude, lysed, uh, uh, crude cell lysates. There's another experiment that we perform um, in parallel to this is that we monitored the NSB. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the NSB at the capture step is very low, okay? And with this um, lye sample, the NSB was in fact very low, okay? Compared to the signal of the captured capsid, the NSB was only about 3% of the total signal, okay? But that signal, was significant, okay? Now the signal is, since this was a crude cell lysate, that, uh, that signal could be due to cell cellular debris, protein, lipids, or even non-capsid DNA. But what we did was we took this probe that only had a uh, signal related to the uh, NSP, we took it through the lysis step and then the DNA assay step. And the DNA signal was essentially zero. It was uh, at the buffer baseline. So this is an example of what I mentioned earlier, that if we have two methods performed sequentially and each method has a high level of specificity that uh, trace contaminants uh, in the initial step uh, do not necessarily transfer over to interference uh, in the second step, which in this case is the DNA asset. Okay, so in summary, okay, uh, we have, um, we have demonstrated that we have uh, you know, fast and easy practical solutions for uh, upstream and downstream uh, you know, quantitation applications. Both the ultra sensitive AAB assay and the empty versus full method that we have uh, have the potential to be used with the crude cell lysates. And lastly, uh, all of these uh, assay methods um, can be performed uh, in an automated manner. Okay. So, um, and again, uh, I think overall, this allows us uh, uh, this allows uh, the Gator Bio system to provide a easy, fast, robust, and uh, actually a high throughput uh, AAB solutions. So I'll hold this now. Open up uh, for a question session. Thank you, Robert, for an excellent presentation. We've received a few questions already, but we'll give you the rest of you a moment to enter your questions into the Q&A box to the left of the slide. Before we begin the q and I'll run through some brief announcements. First, I'd like to thank Gator Bayer for sponsoring this event. Next, I'd like to quickly draw your attention to our face-to-face -face cell and gene therapy manufacturing and commercialization events visiting Boston in September and Amsterdam in December. Now back to Robert to begin the Q&A. Uh, thank you, Catherine. Uh, there are questions uh, that have come in. So the first question is um, that this method does not appear to be capable of distinguishing between partially full and full capsids. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, it will measure okay, um, uh, partially uh, full capsid. Okay. Um, and those will be, um, the DNA content there will be, uh, the total content will be slightly lower, okay? Uh, but uh, the impact of, on whether it's uh, full or partial really depends on the, uh, uh, the size of the DNA when it's partially full. Also, the percentage of um, the partially full capsids uh, in the overall sample. So 
at this point in time, um, it's it's not clear what impact it has on the uh, accuracy of the uh, overall method. Oh, thank you. The next question is, um, does the MT versus full assay require a V or DNA standard curves for quantification? It doesn't require a DNA standard curve. What it requires is a reference set of empty versus full um, uh, mixtures to derive the dose response curve. Okay, but it doesn't require a DNA standard curve. Okay. Thank you. The next question, how does the percent full me measured by BLI compare to percent full measured by AUC? Okay. Um, at this point in time, we haven't, uh, that's in our plan. Uh, we, uh, that's one of the next steps that we have to, um, uh, that we're planning to do, because um, uh, AUC is the accepted reference method at this time. So we are planning to uh, do a, a correlation study to, with AUC. Thank you. For the immunoassay to quantify single-stranded DNA, how specific is it for single-stranded DNA compared to double-stranded DNA? And what is the detected epitopes? Okay. The epi the, well, first of all, the, S, the antibody is very specific uh, for single-stranded DNA. It has um, negligible cross-reactivity to double-stranded DNA, okay? The epitopes are known, okay? All right, also the assay is robust to uh, 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 other materials. For example, it can tolerate protein. In fact, we actually have carrier protein uh, in these reagents. Okay. Can MT and full both performed in a single plate and in a single run assay automatically? At this point, the lysis step is manual, okay? But in development, um, we're designing a, an instrument, a gator instrument that will have a, uh, a heating station. So in the near future, uh, all three steps will be performed automatically. Okay. Uh, next question. Is the probe useful only in AV5 and A for MT versus 4? That's it. Okay. <clears throat> in principle, it can be applied to the other serotypes. Okay. Uh, I think the only issue there is uh, that the, uh, the capture select affinity will vary from serotype to serotype, and that will have an impact on the uh, affinity capture binding kinetics. So I think one will have to characterize and optimize the, um, uh, the capture step uh, with respect to uh, each serotype. Uh, next question, crude samples likely have lower percent full ratios. How low in percent full can, can you quantify? Well, the assay is very sensitive. And as I mentioned earlier, sensitivity of the assay, okay, is not an issue, okay? Um, so, um, you know, we haven't done studies um, looking at a, a very low percentage um, uh, full, uh, but in terms of the analytical performance of the DNA assay, that should not be a problem. Okay. okay. Uh, next question. How's the method affected by the presence of any broken capsule? We haven't studied this enough to be able to, uh, to study um, uh, the impact of broken capsules. Okay. Um, my, uh, my guess is that uh, broken capsids would have their DNA released. So um, the, um, at the affinity capture step, uh, the capture select antibody could, could capture the uh, broken capsids, but uh, they may not contain much DNA. Uh, next question, uh, is ultra-sensitive AV going to be a kit? Yes, and we're going to launch this in a few months. Very okay. near. Uh, next question, have you or do you anticipate this method to be used as a stability indicating method for AV? I assume so, yes, okay. At least in terms of empty versus full, yes. Okay, it could be, yes. Okay. How does the probe capture the single-stranded DNA? 
Well, the um, DNA assay has a uh, antibody, uh, single-stranded DNA antibody immobilized uh, at the tip of the probe. So that's how it performs the capture. Okay, it's simply immersed in the sample after the lysis step. Okay. Uh, next question is, how did you exactly prepare your cell license for this study? Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I can't uh, give you, you know, we, we followed a standard procedure. I'm not the tissue culture uh, specialist, um, but it was a, uh, uh, a standard procedure, okay, uh, under um, uh, literature uh, methods for culturing. Uh, and we did perform the lysis uh, step uh, with a standard uh, detergent reagent, and we performed the uh, clarification step, but also had a nuclease pretreatment. We, uh, we tried to uh, copy the um, literature procedure uh, as closely as possible. Okay. okay. Next question, is the gator system for AAV commercially available, including the automation? Yes, for AAVX and AAV9, it's currently commercially available. Um, next question is, there are many questions here, let me see. How's the uh, reproducibility of the AV MP versus full ratio? We're just starting to look at that, okay? And our preliminary results with crude samples is that the CV is going to be, uh, early indication is going to be around uh, between 10 and 15%. And that's uh, early. Okay. What's the minimum difference of empty versus full you think you can measure using this method? Yeah. Well, that's going to be a function of the uh, the dose response curve, okay, and the, and the slope of the dose response curve, okay. Um, you know, you know, it might be three, four, five percent difference. Okay, and con uh, in uh, empty versus full. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Depending on the on the region of the uh, dose response curve. Okay. Okay. Uh, next question is: Are these methods available for testing? Yes. Okay. I think uh, um, the uh, empty versus full. I think. Yeah, you know, we're not an AAV lab. We're a biosensor lab. Okay, and um, I think this method uh, actually uh, we would really like to get it uh, in the hands of uh, uh, AAV uh, laboratories uh, to uh, to validate it and also get their feedback. Okay, on uh, where we can improve it and what are the advantages and disadvantages uh, of the method. The the empty versus full assay that you performed, what was the, the starting uh, serotype and was it measured with AUC, the empty versus full concentration? It was, uh, the serotype was eight, okay. And the samples, um, we did start with 85% uh, 80, full and it was measured by uh, AUC. Uh, next question, I think this is a repeat of the previous question, how many different serotypes have you tested and will this method be applicable to all the serotypes? Yeah. Well, at this point in time, we've only tested serotype eight, but in principle, you know, we do believe that can be applied to uh, all the other serotypes, okay. Okay, let me go through the list again here. Can Gator Bio run uh, my samples for test? We're uh, we're open to that. Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, one more question I see here. Uh, this is a repeat. Uh, when can we get a beta trial kit? 
Um, well, as soon as possible. Actually, the reality is we have supply chain issues, just like most people. Okay, so right now that's the uh, the major uh, limiting factor. But uh, yes, we want to get this into beta trials uh, uh, is, uh, as soon as possible. Okay. Uh, I think this is a repeat, but you probably answered already. Does the empty versus full assay require uh, calibration curves? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the only, again, the only calibration curve is the uh, the uh, reference samples uh, of uh, uh, different uh, empty versus full ratios. Okay, and let me just run through the questions. Let's see if I missed anything. No, I think these were all the questions that uh, I see here so far. Oh, sorry, there is one new question that that came up, should we contact you directly or someone on your team to explore collaborations? That's for you, Yeah. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, uh, Sabod here uh, is the contact person. Yes, and he will be happy to uh, discuss potential collaborations. Okay. Uh, one more question here. Is the AVX binding to antibodies replaceable with Novel AV caps. Yeah, right. let's see. Repeat that question. Is it is the um, so it's uh, is the AVX binding antibody replaceable with novel AV caps? So I guess the question is, if it's a modified, let's say if the caps or has been, if it's been modified. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, that is going to have to be empirically uh, uh, determined, okay? Um, wh what I could say is that the um, the capture select nanobody, okay, right now, th this is really a first generation product, okay? My guess, and they've already, uh, Thermo's already uh, introduced a uh, AAV9 uh, capture select that has high binding for AAV9. I think in the future, there will be uh, other antibodies or nanobodies that uh, are highly specific for each of the serotypes. So that might give us a, um, a greater chance of performing assays with modified capsids in the future. Okay. Um, there's one more question that just came in. Can we prepare, if I understand the question, correctly, can we prepare our own probes? Uh, yes, there is a probe um, uh, in our menu. Uh, it's called APS uh, that we can absorb uh, binding proteins directly. Uh, then we have another one called e amine reactive uh, probe uh, where uh, one can uh, covalently immobilize uh, uh, proteins on the probe. And then also we have a uh, strepavidin probe that uh, Botulinated proteins can be immobilized. So yes, that uh, one can construct their own assays uh, using the Gator viral probes. Okay. Um, another question: What's the range of single-stranded DNA in KBs kilobytes? So I guess the question is. Or okay. how long or how big? Yeah. Okay. What's the size? Uh, we do believe that uh, preliminary results indicate there is a size sensitivity. Okay. That um, uh, the uh, binding signal does uh, get slightly lower depending on the size of the uh, SSDNA. Okay. And uh, right now we uh, we have samples on order uh, covering uh, the size range from, uh, about 1.6 KB to about 4.5 K, uh, KB, which is in the range of the AAB genome. Okay. So it will be slightly lower. Okay. than compared to our, uh, M13, um, DNA, which had, uh, a 7.2 uh, KB size. Okay. Uh, another question that just came in, are the Gator instruments available in the U.S.? So I guess the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. <clears throat> just going through, I just want to make sure I did not miss anything. I think both these are all the questions um, so far. 
So I don't see any, any other question coming in. So over to you, Catherine. Thanks, Tim. Well, thank you very much, Robert, for a great session there. If anyone did submit a question that wasn't addressed, keep in mind that Robert will reach out to you directly. This session was recorded, and you'll receive a notification in 24 hours when the on-demand session is available for viewing. Before you log off, please take a moment to complete the feedback form so we can continue to improve your Digital Week experience. On behalf of Informa Connect Biosciences, have a great day.